Welcome back to Psychosocial Wednesdays on the 14th of February. Um, Psychosocial Wednesdays is brought to you by Jungianeum, Contemporary Initiatives for Analytical Psychology and Neo-Jungian Studies, founded by Stefano Carpani. Like the um, other parts of the Jungianeum initiatives, like masterclasses, for example, or the yearbook, Psychosocial Wednesdays wants to strengthen society's ability to talk about conflicts. That's what we do here. And uh, a big thank you for supporting this aim goes to the IAAP and Missa Berg that endorsed Psychosocial Wednesdays uh, in its fifth season this year. So today's speaker is Maria Giovanna Bianchi. She is a Jungian anal psychoanalyst in private practice in Geneva, in Switzerland. Um, she got a master's degree in political science from the University of Bologna, a, a PhD in international relations from the University of Padua, and a diploma in Jungian psychoanalysis and psychotherapy specialized in adults, adolescents, and children from the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich. She worked as a human rights officer at the United Nations for almost three decades. Since 2019, she is a member of the board of directors of the C.G. Jung Foundation Zurich. Um, she is also a um, training analyst and supervisor in training at the C.G. Jung Institute and uh, a supervisor for analyst trainees pursuing the router um, training of the International Association for Analytical Psychology. She publishes articles. She is guest at international conferences and lectures in academic and professional contexts. Just recently, she co-edited the book Psychoana Psychoanalytic, Psychosocial and Human Rights Perspectives on Enforced Disappearance by Routledge this year. Um, so one may derive it from her biography, but I will still tell you a bit about her topic today. Our presenter will talk about the overlap between analysts and human right, rights practitioners in healing trauma. Jungian psychoanalysts often encounter the profound psycho psychological effects of human rights violations, such as gender violence, domestic violence, discrimination based on race, religion, sexual orientation, the consequences of war and forced migration. The devastating and pervasive um, psycho psychological effects inflicted on the individuals and societies require an interdisciplinary approach to address these issues. Maria Giovanna Bianchi will explore common tools and guiding principles through examples in her presentation. So before she starts, Stefano Capani also wants to say a few words. So please stay tuned. Thank you. Ludmilla actually is just a hello to everyone and a special thanks to uh, Maria Giovanna, with whom we met in Zurich last weekend for a supervision course. I'm so happy there are so many colleagues from Zurich logged in, but actually from all over the world. And uh, this shows how this topic is interesting. The only thing I would say about this book, and actually about Maria Giovanna, is that she's the only, and it's not a praise, it's a reality, she's the only one uh, who is a graduate Jungian who has a true knowledge of the topic in the field. Many writes about it, many hear about it from clients and patients, but she's the only one in the world. So a special thanks goes to her for having accepted to be part of uh, Psychosocial Wednesday today. Maria Giovanna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, I'm flattered. And at the same time, I hope then to meet the expectation because now the bar is high. I don't know if I'm the only one who has experience in the field, but definitely I devoted a lot of um, my working life to this. So the thanks goes to you for the introduction, of course, and to Ludmilla. Um, uh, it goes to Psychosocial Wednesday for having invited me, and also, of course, to the colleagues 
who um, are online this evening, and then I've decided to divide, to devote some of their time to, to this conversation that I hope it will be interesting, especially in the part following the presentation where we will interact. So um, the why I'm so interested, of course, uh, as you have heard or read, for 28 years, I've been a human rights officer for the United Nations. And uh, for a good part of uh, my career there, I was uh, specializing in victims of torture and, and forced disappearances, uh, which obviously had a toll on me, like on many human rights practitioners. And uh, uh, I started getting interest in psychology and specifically in uh, uh, Jungian uh, analytical psychology, um, just to heal myself, to understand a little bit what was going on. And uh, why uh, Jungian authors were so helpful for me, because they were uh, dueling on concepts like uh, collective unconscious, uh, collective uh, shadow, and evil. So evil was just faced and spoke about, and I would say analyzed, um, in a way that maybe in other branch of psychoanalysis or other um, psychotherapy schools is not done. And um, for me, what was maybe theory, uh, for me was the reality, because I was seeing evil in many, many manifestations. So um, for some time, I had this double head of human rights officer, and I started my training, and then I became an analyst. And more and more, I was seeing uh, the, uh, I wouldn't call it overlap, I would say really affinity, or even a common thread between uh, the human rights practitioner or whether they work at the UN or in an NGO or they're just volunteer and what we do in our practices. So um, the very thing, the very first thing I would like to say is that uh, um, maybe it all starts with the profile of those who do this work. Uh, both of these jobs. And is uh, uh, a kind of uh, psychic setting, um, very much towards geared towards the others. Uh, with this uh, um, um, desire to help, definitely to understand, maybe there is also a part of complex of the savior, and maybe there is also uh, a great sense of sacrifice, because it's true that uh, uh, the individuals who engage in one or the other of these two professions usually also pay a toll in their private life and in the use of their psychic energy, and uh, uh, they uh, can suffer of vicarious trauma. And that I think that in a way there is something that we are geared more or less in the same way. Uh, I think there is also a kind of strong sense of justice in, in both category and of wanting to address uh, what seems not just or not fair. Um, the more I advance in this path, which was my career, but then when you turn to Jungian study, it really becomes your life, your soul, and... and um, much more than that, um, was that human rights and human rights law and uh, psychology and analytical psychology uh, specifically were not uh, going on parallel track at all, but they were more and more converging. Um, although law can uh, sound something dry and very aloof, in reality, especially human rights law, is the most really human. And what does it mean? That is the one that uh, more than other branches of law uh, is very conscious of the uh, importance of the psychological impact of violation on the victims and the importance of psycho, social, and medical support to victims. On the other end, we also know that there are a lot of psychologists, psychoanalysts, 
that are engaged in uh, human rights issues. Uh, this was clear from the very beginning in Chile when Pinochet was a dictator. The psychiatrists and psychologists there were the very first one that hearing the uh, stories in their uh, uh, practices, they understood that the level of oppression, torture, disappearance was widespread, widespread and systematic. And they were the first one to take minutes that then they kept in safe and decade after the minutes of these uh, um, psychologists and psychiatrists were also used in the prosecution of uh, the perpetrators. So th there is this understanding that there is some complementarity and the convergence. So um, very briefly, because I don't want to exceed the time, uh, the 45 minutes that uh, I was allocated for the presentation. I wanted to tell you what uh, um, I found were the guidelines or threads that I followed both as a human rights officer uh, or human rights practitioner and as a, a psychoanalyst in my practice. I will first tell you the six and then we'll briefly speak um, about uh, each one. Um, the first one is give a voice, and then uh, the second one is validate the narrative once you've given voice of the victim, the importance of the family and the community and of the network, um, the importance of memory, both personal and collective, advocacy, given that is also part uh, of a lot which is discussed at Psychosocial Wednesday, and the importance of uh, justice in the healing process. Justice in understood both as the attribution of responsibility, but also as reparation of things that sometimes are irreparable, unfortunately. So um, before I start, I forgot one thing that I wanted to tell you when I said we are a little bit geared, both profession, um, with the same psychic maybe structure that gives a lot of importance in justice. Um, justice for Jung was, uh, uh, he defined it a uh, um, psychic, a collective psychic content. And uh, of course, it's an archetype. You find it in uh, every mythology, there is a goddess or a god of justice or several. And Mat in the Egyptian mythology, uh, she was the goddess who was responsible for uh, weighing on the scale the heart of the disease against the feather of the truth to see how light it was. And if it, you know, the weight was not equal, then the person could have not uh, um, go beyond. Uh, in this ritual, there was also the uh, deceased person had to do what was called the 42 negative uh, um, affirmation, negative confessions in front of 42 different judges. And the very first one of the 42, and I read it because uh, I would like to say um, exactly what it is. It says the first negative confession was, I have not done crimes against people. So even before an individual component, I have not cheated, I have not uh, uh, stolen, um, I have not betrayed, or whatever it is, the very first negative confession was of a collective uh, um, uh, nature. And uh, saying I've not done crimes against people in contemporary language sounds very like uh, I've not committed crimes against humanity. Now, crimes against humanity by law, by definition, are committed by states, not by individuals. But we understand uh, how we can associate the two. So let's go back then uh, to this uh, six uh, thread that I found I used in both my uh, work. Um, the first one of giving voice, I think it's really critical and is the first one because when it comes to victims of human rights violation, 
usually human rights violations are uh, perpetrated in silence. Um, or if the society is aware, uh, there are a lot of so-called bystanders that pretend they don't see. And uh, it has also a lot to do with power and or let's say an imbalance of power. Of course, the victim is powerless in front of the power of the perpetrator and doesn't have a voice. Um, so giving voice is empowering the person to tell their story. Uh, what we call narrative in our practices and in a protected space. So when a human rights practitioner meets a, a, a victims of human rights violation is exactly that. Maybe for the first time they tell in a totally protected space uh, what has happened, their pain, uh, their humiliation, their suffering, physical, emotional, psychological. And uh, um, if you think of a uh, psychoanalyst, when somebody comes to us, we also there give a voice. Very often secrets are shared for the very first time. Um, one's own narrative uh, is expressed. And this in a tenemos, in a protective space, where nothing bad can happen. I mean, bad things are retold, maybe relieved, but the space is protected. And that I found this is something that we already have in common. The second part, uh, I mentioned narrative. When validate the narrative, what does it mean? It's validating um, the story as the victim has lived it. So the truth of the victim. Uh, now, here there is a little bit of a difference because, of course, a human rights practitioner uh, will go for the factual truth, right? Uh, because you have to assess a case, you have to reconstruct a crime. However, there is enough sensitivity to let the victim speak their story because, after all, is the way they have lived it, not our. And uh, this just the fact of listening gives validation. And this external validation is extremely helpful, especially if there is shame or if uh, uh, there is this misplaced uh, sense of guilt that very often victims have. Because validating the narrative is saying, it was not your fault. I hear you. This is what you live, and it was not you, um, which hopefully, if everything works well, um, brings to an integration of this part of the life of the person. It's not going back. There is no going back when a violation happens. Although there are some guidelines in law that says bring the person, restitute the person to the uh, situation before the violation happened. Psychologically, it's impossible. You can restitute money, you can restitute a home, you cannot restitute uh, the, the psyche before it was so heavily um, traumatized. So um, also, I would like to say a caveat and a little parenthesis. Um, I use the word victims. Uh, why? Uh, I think it's the heritage of 30 years as human rights officer. Victim is a legal term. Uh, it's basically, if there is a victim, there is a crime, and you can go, uh, you can prosecute the perpetrators. If there is no victim, there is no crime, you cannot bring them to justice. And in the psychotherapeutic world and psychoanalysts and psychologists, they prefer to use the term survivor uh, because it gives the idea that the person has resources and you know, can transform and uh, uh, still, uh, even in face of abuse, thrive and have a life. So I really have respect for both terms. Uh, and I understand the logic behind the two. Uh, I will keep on telling victims uh, because in my personal opinion, uh, it is part of the validation of the narrative saying, yes, at a certain point you were a victim. At a certain point you were powerless and there was an imbalance of power and torture, rape, 
whatever has happened. Um, and then you survived. But at that point, you were a victim. And uh, no matter how we talk, we cannot uh, not acknowledge that this thing has happened. And this will be one of the events that will really um, shape also the psyche of the person. This doesn't mean that you label as somebody incapable of overcoming such a traumatic situation. It has nothing to do with that. It's really a legal term. So we have seen give voice and we have seen validate the narrative. Uh, the third element is the attention to the family and the community. Now, in, when it comes to human rights violation, it's a little bit tricky because it's it like in our uh, practice, when a client uh, comes to you, you do the anamnesis and then you ask, even if not directly, but you try to understand what are the dynamics of the family? What is the situation of this person? Especially, are there elements that are disturbing or are the cause of the problem or are there resources? Because families or some members of the families can be a great resource. Now, when it comes to human rights violation, usually human rights violation is not against an individual, but is against the community. Uh, or a specific group. And uh, what does it mean? It means that the entire community is affected, that the family is affected, community is affected, society is affected. So you cannot count too much on that as resources. And uh, not only in the present or the immediate future after human rights violation occur, but even in the future. This is the famous transgenerational transmission of trauma, which has been proven by so many studies. It exists, it affects um, the first, the second, the third generation in very different way, but still uh, it means that it's a little bit difficult when you have um, in front of you a victims of human rights uh, violation, you are a little bit on your own. You cannot count on the support of the family or the community, uh, not as you would normally do. Uh, the element, the other element that is very important, and I saw it was important in both um, fields, is the attention to memory, um, both as an individual memory, but also archetypal memory, collective memory, and also how uh, we will see also how in certain uh, treaties and how in human rights law uh, memory is important. So um, when you are a human rights officer or human rights practitioner, you really have to pay attention because, of course, you elicit memories to assert and ascertain facts. Um, at the same time, you really walk a thin line because you want to have the facts, but you don't want to re-traumatize uh, and re-victimize the person who's talking to you. Um, I have to say that uh, only now, recently, something is done for the vicarious trauma of the people who work in human rights, and also to train them in uh, uh, interview monitoring technique on this specific aspect. Um, I like to think, I have a lot of respect of my former colleagues, uh, the way we they keep on doing and I used to do it is very intuitive. So you know when you have to push and you know when you have to stop. The principle is mainly a principle of respecting dignity and compassion in front of the pain of the others. So even if a piece of information would be so important to reconstruct the picture, you know, if you see that it makes more damage than good, you just don't do it. Um, in a way, it's the same in our practices. Um, you do elicit memory, um, but you don't crash the defense of your client. So also there, you have this intuition of how far you can go and when you have to step back. But memory is fundamental. And if we think the psychoanalysis with Freud started as uh, the psychoanalysis of the traumatized people, the hysterical, those were the trauma or the trauma, you know, of uh, repression, of 
certain unwanted material, etc. So when it comes to that, there is a beautiful uh, chapter um, by Adler in, I think the book is The Dynamics of the Self, and there is a chapter on uh, uh, remembering and forgetting. And what he says is that both remembering and forgetting are polarities of the self that also constitute the self. And when it comes to remembering, and it, it's beautiful, it, uh, it says memory, it means that you recollect. You recollect the pieces of something, you put them together in a new wall, and in this new wall, you give a new meaning. Um, while you say forgetting is more about the ego and is more about the defense, I would also say that it's not only a defense, forgetting. Sometimes you can't remember, sometimes it's a dissociation, but sometimes there is also forgetting as letting go. When you think that you have finished a certain kind of job with a lot of pain, you may decide to let go. So that's also part of the forgetting. Um, so it's very important, of course, with victims of human rights violation or highly traumatized patients to balance well the, the memory, uh, the remembering, and understanding the nature of the forgetting. In international human rights law, it is recognized the importance of memory. Uh, in 2005, the General Assembly adopted something which is called basic principle on victims of gross violation of human rights. It's very articulated. At that time, it was landmarking. You can find it on the web. Uh, so very easy to find. And it was basically giving a se series of tools for reparation. And one under collective reparation is keeping memory alive in the forms of memorials. Uh, memorials are, you know, by definition, usually collective, can be naming the street or a particular site after an event or the name of a person, the walls with the name of people, uh, just uh, to remember that, you know, their sacrifice was something, but you also have the Stolperstein in uh, Europe and you have the Baldosas in uh, uh, Latin America. And that's the idea that memory is not only for the past, it is also for the future. Um, in the book that, uh, uh, I recently co-edited with Monica Lutzi. Uh, there is a chapter on memory and exactly the importance of memory. Um, first, uh, because the individuals who uh, basically uh, were lost <laughs> because of human rights violation, their sacrifice was for nothing, but is also for the future as a reminder that whether we like it or not, we have this part of us that individual and collective can be very destructive. And uh, Jung spoke about human rights violation um, in, uh, I think it was in Collective Work 16, and how mass destruction and the unconscious um, can invade and the level of consciousness lower when the phenomenon becomes a phenomenon of, of mass. And that's where the shadow become a very powerful collective shadow. Whether we like it or not, that's that's part of us. And analytical psychology puts it up front. That's why I think I felt it was so close to me uh, when I start studying. So um, finally, not finally, actually, the ultimate point is really the advocacy. Um, and we talk a lot about of advocacy. So what, what is advocacy? You can have very different level of activities, but basically is an intentional activity um, through which you want to have a political result or any way you want to have influence on those who have the power to decide or uh, to adopt policies. I like to think um, that both for a human rights practitioner and for psychoanalysts, Jungian psychoanalysts, is also an attitude. And what is this attitude? Is the attitude to stand by 
the human rights victim or your client in your practice with unconditional support. You know, we just stay there once we have heard their voice, validate their narrative, help with the resources, balance memory. At a certain point, you just stand next to them. And that's why we have to be interested in our clients. No, Jung was very clear. If you're not interested in the person's going better, just don't take this person as a client. That's as easy as that. And that is, you know, whatever it comes, I stand by you, uh, next to you, until you can function. And uh, at collective level, it means also speaking up for those who in that moment cannot speak or are too weak or too just damaged. Um, in a way, is when we say that sometimes we lend our egos to the clients until their ego functions, for a human rights officer or a human rights practitioner is similar. Um, until some dignity is given. And you can say that advocacy can be really particularly important, especially when the um, second generation of the person who have been victims of human rights violation uh, can participate. And so you break this transgenerational transmission of trauma, which is basically unconscious, and become an intergenerational transmission. So it is conscious. It is safe. This happened. You know, and you know, I I integrate this, and then I react with the tools and the resources that I have. Um, finally, there is this idea that justice heals. Uh, in the example that I gave you before, um, talking about uh, the situation in Chile, um, when uh, Pinochet was arrested in London, he was arrested using an instrument of human rights law, which is called universal jurisdiction, that basically say that if a person is guilty of uh, crimes that can amount to crimes against humanity, wherever this person is, a judge can basically uh, order an arrest warrant. So, P uh, so uh, Baltasar Garzón, a judge from Spain, issue an arrest order for Pinochet, who was in a clinic in London. Um, in the book mentioned, uh, again, that I edited, uh, I co-edited with Monica Luzzi, uh, Baltasar Garzón was so generous that wrote a chapter of how much he paid in personal price to fight impunity. So basically, when Pinochet was arrested, uh, the chief of the psychiatric unit of the psychiatric hospital of Santiago del Chile say that they had an avalanche of requests of uh, assistance. Why? Because it had a cathartic effect, even if in the end he died before going, uh, um, you know, going under trial, but it had this cathartic effect where people um, felt that they could finally speak. They were less afraid uh, symptoms were relieved. Uh, this uh, person, uh, this psychiatrist, um, you can just Google and you will find interview in which she was saying symptoms like persistent headache uh, disappear. A person started trusting life again, trusting justice and looking for uh, um, help, psychotherapy help. So there is something in justice uh, that and so this is what human rights practitioner try to make happen, and also analysts that has the quality of a reparation. Um, and it's difficult to quantify, right? Uh, what really, uh, what, what's the impact? But um, I think we can understand really at the level of the soul. That's why we say we decided to uh, title this presentation Advocate of the Soul, how much this is important um, for person who were um, heavily traumatized. So um, the final, final point is that uh, uh, I think, and it's happening more and more in, uh, uh, in analytical societies, but also in law, 
to think in terms of transdisciplinarity. Transdisciplinarity is different from interdisciplinarity when you pick a little bit from each discipline. But it's really the idea how we can look at this phenomenon, at this thing together, uh, trying to find a common meaning with the tools that we have. Um, the transdisciplinarity between analytical psychology or psychoanalysis or psychotherapy and the system to victims uh, of violation and human rights law is definitely the idea that the meaning is the importance of justice, but is also the dignity, human dignity, and the um, reparation for the victims. Uh, so maybe for us, for those of us who studied uh, at the Jung Institute, or when the law allowed, we come from very different paths of lives. And I think this is so enriching. So you can look at psychoanalysis and art. I see in front of me a dear friend who's an artist and a painter, and that she will have a view on violations and art and analysis that is different for mine. I see a professor at the University of Music. He will bring something that I cannot bring but they resonate with the soul. I see, you know, I think that was the richness that we really had. Now the curriculum of study are a little bit different, but let's use until we have this richness of looking at how we can really make the difference in people who went through uh, things that sometimes uh, we cannot even imagine using whatever we can use and using the richness of the, um, basically the community that we have uh, in the analytical psychology. So I would stop here. So we have time maybe to exchange. Uh, thank you for your attention until now, if you're still there, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> there are still many people there. Thank you so much, uh, Maria Giovanna, uh, for sharing your experiences um, as well as your knowledge uh, on this um, yeah, utterly important and um, topical issue, uh, I would say. Um, it was a fantastic presentation and um, yeah, very compelling. Um, now, if you have any questions, you can either raise your digital hand or you just come forward. Now we have a lot of time for discussion and questions. I see uh, Christina Stein is raising her real hand. <laughs> Please, Christina. Yeah, Giovanna, I, um, uh, I will not say a very um, wow thing but something that moved me a lot uh, from the beginning, when you say, oh, it moves me again. Um, justice is collective. It's an archetype. And uh, I'm very moved because uh, you read in the newspapers, in the news about human rights, and it's, as you said, very factual. And the way you present it to us is uh, moves me because here is the archetype again, right? And um, it, uh, it gives awareness. Uh, only this, set, the rest is important, is um, full of information. Um, However, this to say justice is an archetype gives so much awareness of what happens in the newspaper, the way you presented it. So I want to thank you because it's moving. Well, uh, it moves because it touches the soul. Exactly. Yeah. And... Uh, um... Well, and I, I don't I don't want to touch the contemporary more than that, but having devoted a lot of my life uh, to uh, human rights within the United Nations, I have the utmost of my former colleagues who keep on doing this job. And sometimes you have to be factual for the factual reason, recording that's what is needed, but also to protect yourself. 
Mm -hmm. uh, because their soul is at stake every time they do a difficult mission or even they read very disturbing material. It's interesting how the justice is an archetype. And so basically an archetype is, um, well, we all know, but you know, it's it's a more, Jung says is a mode of apprehension, no? That we come and we already have this mode of apprehension that, you know, it was molded by the experience of all those who came before us. And there is, there has been a study, I think it's not recent, it's already maybe, uh, it could be eight years ago or so at the university. And uh, uh, they exposed toddlers, two years old, in front of uh, unfair behavior. So basically, uh, the two persons were rewarded in different way for the same thing. And uh, basically the toddlers, their mimic, their facial expression was uh, like surprise. It went in some rage or anyway, at that age, they understood something here is not right. Mm. Something is not how it should be. So we really have this archetypal, and then the archetypes, also Jung says, are forms without content. So up to us what we want to put in the archetype of justice, because if all we had the imprint of the justice in the way we understand, then we wouldn't have many problems, right? You know, also justice is an interpretation. You have uh, retributive justice. You have the justice in the Bible that is eye for eye, you know? You have the reparation justice, but profoundly we know, you know, our souls know. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Christina. And Thank it's such you. a pleasure seeing you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, in the chat, there was the question about your book, Maria uh, Giovanna. Um, so, Paul Attinello has written down the title and uh, contributed the um, link to the yes. book. Um, yeah. That is. May I say something about the book? It's not so much of publicity, course. but I think it, it was an effort uh, of putting together the two disciplines. So there is a lot of literature on enforced disappearances, uh, both either exclusively law, you know, what it is, how it's prosecuted, et cetera, et cetera, or exclusively psychology. Uh, so assistant to victims. And this was really trying to bridge the two. And so in the various chapters, you have both human rights practitioners, you have uh, uh, quite prominent UN uh, figures. We call them special rapporteurs on extra summary execution. You have the judge that I mentioned before. You have victims, that is, uh, victims in enforced disappearance is, are the family, um, because it's very rare that the disappeared person is found and comes back. And in this, uh, human rights law is also progressive, because victim is not only the person, but they recognize that the family are victims as well because of the psychological torture inflicted to these people who will not see their loved ones again. So there are also victims speaking. And one is uh, actually a psychoanalyst herself. Her mother was a psychoanalyst and disappeared in Argentina. So she wrote about how to go through such a kind of grief. Um, uh, there is an artist who speaks about their understanding and on the cover of the book you have a big question mark because in human rights violation you have a lot of question marks and little uh, replies. I wrote something on memory along uh, what I was telling you before, the memorials. So it was really trying to say without narcissistic gratification, but can we put our head together? get one chapter each and try to give um, a picture, the most complete possible of the extent of suffering behind uh, this uh, specific crime, but can also be torture, can also be many other things that keep on happening in the world right now while we speak. 
So that that's why I think it's an interesting book. It's um, because of the intent behind it and the way that uh, um, it collects uh, different material, but coherent. So, and so I, I hope there will be many more attempts by other colleagues to try this transdisciplinarity. Paul Atinello has a question. Please, Paul. Um, this is a little broad as my God, all my questions are. Um, does it make, how much of a difference does it make in these processes, in this working? If there's a general sense that the world around it or the world is stable with bad things happening in it, or if the world itself seems rather unstable and there seems to be more as it were, darkness floating around. You know, people seem to speak of the world that way a lot these days. And mm. this is interesting. And honestly, I don't think the world has ever been stable. This is our perception, depending on when you live at certain time in history. Now in Europe, uh, because of the Russian aggression to Ukraine and because of other things, all of a sudden, war, uh, refugee, asylum seeker, it's real because we start being scared, physically scared. But the more the world has been unstable in so many other conflicts. You know, there are 23, at least 23 conflicts of the same intensity all over the world is just because in our part of the world, unless you are a human rights officer, you don't know, you don't see them. But the world has always been unstable. Uh, and, and that's why centering oneself is, is so important. I want to, uh, le let, me, let me read something that I always have Andy. And it's paragraph 302. Uh, 302 of Collective Work 16, The Practice of Psychotherapy, Jung. He says, mass degeneration does not only come from without, it also comes from within, from the collective unconscious. He writes this in 43, so Second World War. Against the outside, some protection was offered by Le Droit de l'Homme, uh, French original, which at present are lost to the greater part of Europe. And even when they are not actually lost, we see political parties, as naive as they are powerful, doing their best to abolish them in favor of the slave state with the bait of social security. And then it goes in another direction. But basically, I think that the world has always been unstable. And that's why the work that we do in the analysis of centering, it's so important. And let me be totally outspoken in the sense that sometimes I think I had a conversation with a colleague on email uh, lately, an exchange, and I think we both agreed that activism has to be constructive, not destructive. You know, you have to have a center. You have to be a container. You have to understand that there are different narratives different voices, different truth, and you really have to contain it. So I think that that's what the, the part in our practice, the, our contribution is containing and never, never assume that the world will be a place uh, stable as our psyche are not stable. You know, it's a reflection. I, I at least this is my opinion and the way I would reply to you. Are there more questions? Still, Stefano? <laughs> the final button. Maria Giovanna, can I ask you something about uh Juez Garzoro, former minister, Spanish former minister Garzon, because it's pretty amazing to have such an authority especially a controversial authority on a Jungian book. Uh, now, even Tom Singer is able to get somebody that is that level, somebody who was involved with uh, humanitarian crime. So um, more like a, 
San Valentine romantic story. You told me something the other day. I hope there is something you can share. But how, how came the idea to have uh, such a, a, a prime uh, judge in a book? There is a Jungian book on for this appearance. Yeah, you're talking of Baltasar Garzón, right? Yeah, yes. Baltasar Garzón, yeah, yeah. Quest Garzón, yeah. Uh, uh, well, I mean, um, I met him. Um, when when I was, uh, as, as I said at the beginning, a, a great part of my career at the UN uh, was on enforced disappearance. First, as secretary, a secretary in the UN language is the professional who coordinate the work of uh, experts sometimes. First, um, so I was coordinating the work of experts on what is called the working group on disappearances, and then the first committee on enforced disappearance. And the committee is the uh, treaty body, the organ that monitors the implementation of the convention of the treaty by those state parties that have basically uh, ratified. And so Spain, who had ratified the convention, came up for review. And uh, uh, in Spain, uh, at that moment, there are many uh, mass graves had been found going back to the civil war that very likely contained the remains of the disappeared, of the missing, hmm? you want to go. And uh, Baltasar Garzón, uh, in that moment, he was uh, ordering the opening of a mass grave. And then for a series of things, basically, he was uh, removed. And de facto, these mass graves were not opened at all. And this happened in a democracy, right? Just to say how difficult it is to deal with the past for every state. It, it takes a long, long time uh, for psychological reason, really. So um, he was there and obviously we start adding conversation. And so when I start thinking who could it be helpful in understanding how difficult it is to fight impunity um, and my thinking was the following. We think of human rights and human rights law as we tend to think everything in our life as a linear process, and it's never a linear process. Human rights uh, evolution is almost always accompanied by human catastrophes like wars, genocides, and whatever, and it's never linear. And each time that human rights or human rights law uh, evolves, it is um, it constellates incredible, powerful opposition. And if we speak in uh, uh, our language uh, of a psychoanalyst, we say why? Because it confronts the shadow. We confront our shadow. We confront that part of us that is capable. And at mass level, we're even capable of worse. So I was thinking who? pay the price yeah, to apply the law. Law is, is it, from outside, it looks like a cool instrument. It's not, it's never like this. Um, it, it's very, very human. And so I thought of Baltasar Garzón. So I sent him an email saying, uh, maybe you don't remember. <laughs> we met, I was the secretary, da, 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 da. And then it's funny because as I told you, the detail is that he replied to one of his staff inadvertently copying me in Spanish saying, it's true that I don't remember, but the book seems interesting. <laughs> um, and from there, uh, he, he sent a very, very long chapter that we had to reduce. And it, it, it's really the personal narrative of the price that somebody can pay to do the right thing, you know, for the Thank justice. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks I th for and the I think question. The, now, this bit is so important, you know, the price that somebody that is as an ethic, as a moral, is paying to do justice, to say the truth. <clears throat> I, mean, I lived in Spain at that time, and uh, that was really interesting. Concha, you remember that then he became a minister. He was really, really... <clears throat> He was beaten hard as a minister, and then he basically disappeared from the public scene for a bit. And now you have him to come up again. So 
keep the promise we published the full uh, 30 pages of of the I of didn't the promise you this is I, I said I would contact him and ask whether he agrees <laughs> it's okay it's a promise listen another question if there are no other questions <clears throat> because you just said this example and placed it to the past Argentina just went through an election that was shocking and uh, the president of Argentina, the government of Argentina is basically denying what happened for many decades or is, is trying to change history, reverse history. Uh, did you hear anything from, from your colleagues? What is the feeling, if you know anything, from, from Argentina? Because it's not easy to be there right now. Mm, I think that there were worries, obviously. I think we have to see uh, what happens. There were some declarations that definitely were disturbing. Um, what I feel strongly also hearing uh, people with whom I work and then became friends, um, I think that once you go through such a level of suffering, because the entire society in Argentina suffered, and again, the fabric of uh, of the society uh, was really it was really difficult to rebuild it, but it's strong. So I really don't think that it will be possible to go back to impunity law or something like this. There is a, a, a society quite alive. Um, there is the ESMA. The ESMA was uh, the school, uh, the naval school. Uh, in which that became a secret detention center and in which uh, most of the uh, torture and killings or from where the famous uh, um, death flight uh, departed, right? Um, if you go there, <clears throat> now it's a UNESCO site. Uh, and, uh, and I really invite anybody who is in Argentina to go and see. I see that there is a level, I think that there was an obvious frustration for the economic situation of Argentina, you know, right? So we perfectly know that can be um, uh, a vote of protest or whatever. So I can understand why, uh, there are certain kind of elections, certain uh, um, characters are elected. Uh, we've seen it in Argentina, we've seen it in other democracy, we have seen it in Italy at a certain point. In uh, Jungian terms, we say that we also need the trickster. <laughs> we need the trickster so that there is a shake at the consciousness. I think there is preoccupation, um, especially before, the election and immediately after, I think that, I hope, I'm right, thinking that the society, civil society is still very strong and very aware and very conscious and it will not be so easy uh, to take certain measure. Hmm? We'll see. Let's hope. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there yes. is one question in the chat. I will read it out for you. Uh, yes. Antonio Lanfranchi uh, wants to know, ciao, ciao Giovanna, what is your opinion ciao. about the link between the economics of globalization and structural violence, especially in poor countries? And then Antonio, he added, and yeah. also intramuros. I'm totally not qualified to reply. No, honestly, I, I'm, I can have opinions, but uh, I, I really not. I think that yes, of course we know that there, that north south has always existed. Now I think at the level of globalization, um, the changes, the artificial intelligence give us scenario that change so quickly that we cannot see. Definitely, uh, I think it favors you know uh, structure of violence, um, but. I think that this is one part of the reading. And I'm not qualified because my interest and the kind of my readings, personal readings, and trying to understand 
go much more go much more in the direction of the um, really analytical psychology. So that is what 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 at the level of the individual happens. Um, Jung said very clearly in another quote that the mass and the structure does not change if the individual does not change, right? So it's the usual interaction between individual and collective, but if there is not um, um, an in the individual, what's going on at the individual level, getting conscious of your reaction, of your projection or whatever, is then very difficult uh, that this doesn't happen at, at the global level. But such a specific question, I apologize, but I don't think I would give you a satisfactory reply. Okay, are there more questions? The chat is quiet for now, um, but we still take questions, of course. Still have time. Silence. Um, maybe I try a question um, about the role of analysts. I think you touched upon it. Um, how can I say this? Well, um, considering the uh, psychological effects that you mentioned, um, do you see a need for um, analysts to um, also follow the maybe broader goal also for analysts um, to address the systemic issues that are contributing uh, to human rights violations? Or is that not the role? No, I, but I think that has a lot to do with our individual inclination, consciousness. I would also say, um, uh, in which part of our lives we are. I mean, psychological development is something, you know, when you are 25 and 30, the world is yours, you're outside, you conquer, and it's your fight, and you're the warrior, and, you know, who cares, basically. Um, maybe when you get to the second part of life, you start uh, asking other questions. I do definitely see a role for the analyst in getting involved. Now, I think that how you get involved makes a difference. And that's what a little bit what I was saying before. I think that um, analysts have um, a fundamental role in trying to, what we were saying before we went live, holding the tension, right? I mean, contain all the tension. The world is not a safe place, uh, not always. It's always changing. It can be unpredictable. There are powers that we cannot control, whether we like it or not. I mean, we don't even have the control of ourselves. Let's be frank, okay? So we also fight our little wars, the pettiness, and we see in our institutes why we shy away from there, separation, fights, envy. We are humans. How can we imagine a world inhabited by humans that does not reflect how our psyche works, right? So uh, that's it, you know, and, and I really think that uh, we really make to have the effort to contain, um, even when we fight for justice, you know, uh, I have incredible figures in my mind that fought for human rights, and they did it by containing, um, which didn't mean, and they fought the oppressor in different ways. And I give you some names. I oh, am yeah. Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, Martin Luther King. It's not that they were not vocal, <laughs> but you know, they had this kind of really, uh, they were really centered in their soul, in their self, you know. And I think that uh, without absolutely not comparing ourselves to <laughs> these um, giants, but I think that's the stand. You know, I think that with the skills that we were taught, with the 
thousands of hours of analysis that if Chofas has done, you know, I think that containing, holding the tension also um, for those who can't, I think that maybe is our um, uh, most, uh, I would say, most professional contribution, meaning most peculiar to our profession. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, Scott Heider uh, in the chat commented, thank you very much. Can you imagine a better quorum than the United Nations to attempt to hold nations and entities, uh, corporations responsible? I don't know, because, you know, um, I'm attached to the United Nations. <laughs> I still believe in the United Nations. And definitely the United Nations uh, was a reflection of a certain balance of power, which is now 80 years old and things are changing. And the fact that you have, uh, you know, five powers in the Security Council and one can put a veto and the entire machinery is blocked, it makes me think that, uh, no, it's not the best way. Uh, maybe a better quorum would be enlarging. Um, there is something very effective. It's quite technical, uh, but I will give you an example um, that um, the Human Rights Council, until uh, 15, 20 years ago, uh, basically the usual suspect or the usual situation in certain countries was coming up and it was considered extremely unfair. So um, a mechanism has been created, which is called universal periodic review by which the uh, human rights situation of all countries in the United Nations is periodic review. What happened? That from a smaller you know, group, it was made wider. So everybody is under scrutiny. And there is a complicated system, which is called Troika, in which states look at each other and they have to do reports. I'm not going in the detail. But what I'm saying is, I think that the play, the world would be a worse place without the United Nations. Now, that is not perfect, is sure, but it would definitely be a worse place in terms of ceasefire in certain area, in terms of children vaccinated, in terms of, um, you know, uh, other advancement in other area. Um, another, another quorum, I'm afraid it will depend from other assets, which will mean that um, from an international viewpoint, the main entity will not be states, sovereign states anymore. So what is going to be? We don't know. Uh, and anyway, if there is a transition, it will not be a transition uh, easy. Hmm? So, or peaceful. So that's what I can think. Thank you. Christina has her hand up, please go. Yes, um, Giovanna, uh, you live in Switzerland, if I'm not wrong. Um, a basic question, did you work <clears throat> with these kinds of victims? Did you, uh, I mean, did uh, you, are you asking me you if there are victims a... in Switzerland? Anywhere, I mean. No, I didn't you understand live in the question. Switzerland, I mean, uh, in my imagination, you are not in one of these uh, countries, um, you know, in the everyday life, we are in a in a in a different uh, okay. situation of yeah. life. So my question is, did you work with this kind of uh, injustice we all have? But I mean, this war injustice. Yes. Did you Yes, working? yes, definitely, definitely. So I don't know if I understood well the question, but I tried to 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 reply like uh, both as human rights officer, I worked with victims in the usual suspect countries, but in Switzerland as well. As an analyst, as a human rights officer, and as an analyst. And why as an analyst? Because actually in Switzerland, there is an incredible high number of um, 
uh, asylum seeker, mm -hmm. refugees. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, before becoming refugees, they are asylum seekers, uh, which uh, expose you to a much higher level of anxiety because you don't know whether your refugee status will you will be recognized as a refugee or you will be sent back. So in Switzerland, there are a lot. We're talking about transgenerational transmission of trauma. Uh, the University of Lausanne is doing, and again, one article is of three researchers of the University of Lausanne is in this book. Uh, they made a research or the second or third generation of uh, children uh, of victims of enforced disappearances in Latin American countries. Okay. And, uh, and the impact was, was already here. You know, it's not by uh, chance that in Geneva, you have a garden which is called Le Jardin des Disparus, the garden of the disappeared, because there is a big community of family of person who disappeared. And, and apart from my specific, um, I mean, uh, let's call it specialization, but of course you have victims of human rights violation in Switzerland. Yeah, yeah, no, I just wanted to, in your yes. practice, yes. or perhaps not in your everyday practice, but... No, it's you... not everyday. It, exactly, yeah, it, exactly. It's balanced, it's balanced with more classic. But exactly, I can imagine. But did you, did you have contact with this kind of yes. analysis with this? Yes. And, and the way of analyzing is perhaps even more careful, no? Absolutely. There is, uh, there are a lot of uh, also victims of torture. Exactly. In Geneva. And then you have to work a lot with uh, dissociation, right? Uh, so that is, uh, I mean, with, with uh, clients who dissociated as mm. a way to survive during the trauma during the event, during the torture, and therefore um, something we are not used to do, uh, not so much or not all of us, uh, you, you become much more conscious of the body as well, because the body is the issue, is the object of torture. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sometimes compassionate presence and containment is all what you can do. And sometimes is all what is needed. Mm -hmm. Uh, until the moment comes that something different is possible. Okay. Uh, I also work, as you know, with children and adolescents. And uh, and uh, children, I think, are uniquely affected when they are in uh, asylum seeker centers. Uh, so that, but, you know, we, we always have to look at the good thing. Uh, it's good that we are there and we can do it. Exactly. No, I was just wondering the analysis uh, is um, probably you know, quite I, different, right? I think the analysis is that we uh, follow different paths and different schools that for which we had an inclination. So we mainly here are Jungians, but there are others who are different. And at the end, psychotherapy or analysis is the encounter between two persons. Exactly. And so according to what you have in front of you, you take out a different tool. Obviously, you don't start talking about mythology and association. <laughs> but, no, but but what you say, right? This compassionate presence. Yeah. But I had one. Um, I, um, I can present this case very briefly because I did it before and I had uh, the written permission of the parents and of the child. One of my clients, uh, I started uh, having him in therapy, he was nine uh, and he was uh, a Syrian child, uh, asylum seeker uh, in Switzerland. And uh, at a certain point, he, his life in Switzerland was very difficult, hmm? almost more than before, because it was so different, the difficulties here. And I will, he uh, made uh, a drawing for me 
in which he was leaving from his home, he was crossing the border, and then the time that it took after crossing the border, so reaching physical safety and going to a cave where he found treasure was much longer, as if the time in a, a safe, a physically safe environment looked even longer for him because there was the uncertitude. And this child perfectly understood when I talked to him in terms of the uh, the journey of the hero and how he was a hero and how in the cave the journey was long but in the cave there was a treasure and the treasure was his resilience. So I think that Jungian analysts more and more, I'm sure in all of our practice, we have more and more, we can have the possibility of have this kind of clients, which definitely uh, were not the one that Jung was seeing. Um, and I think we can have our own approach. It's not only trauma therapy, it's not only uh, other kind of therapy, a spiritual approach that especially the Jungian can have is healing can be particularly healing. When you speak in these terms, it gives hope, it gives meaning, it gives many things. And then I think that we should really mm, emphasize that we can have really a role in, uh, in healing this person, mm -hmm. not just uh, upholding our school of thoughts, but healing those who need it. Thank you. It's uh, exactly the answer I was waiting for. Yes. Welcome. Thank you for the question and uh, also thank you for the answer and sharing this case. Um, Kevin Fleischer uh, also is writing into the chat. Many thanks, Giovanna, for your presentation and thanks for bringing your reflections about the actual and very sad situation we're living in in Argentina regarding human rights. And uh, thanks to Stefano for bringing it up. So, yeah. yeah. A comment, yes. Yeah. So, um, are there more questions? We have time for one more. What um, maybe also, Giovanna, if you have something to add that comes to your mind now after the discussion or towards the end of the discussion, feel free. Um, um, no, I, well, just to renew my thanks. Um, Thanks for the questions, uh, for the space. I think that um, we are among the converted here, right? <laughs> so, so in a way, there are no difficult questions or embarrassing or whatever. But I really think that uh, um, maybe just the two main things that matter to me is this idea that our role is we can do a lot in containing in this period of turmoil. And the second is what uh, I just said in reply to Christina and her question that let's not think um, that our contribution um, is only in advocacy, is only in politics or is only we may really have this kind of client, you know. Uh, persons with trauma because of human rights violation. And let's, uh, in a way, um, be fully conscious that analytical psychology is a uh, um, school of psychoanalysis, that we have technique, uh, whether it is exactly um, amplification, association, active imagination that can really be effective. And that I think maybe this is not, um, yeah, uh, so well understood. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, awesome. Also, again, thank you on behalf of the Jungian Neum team for um, being with us tonight for the very insightful talk. It was really an honor to have you. Um, and thank you, everybody else, for um, uh, the vivid discussion tonight. Um, I will give you a brief outlook on March because we actually have two uh, appointments for you in March. On the 13th of March, um, Mary Watkins will be in conversation with Stefano Carpani about the trajectory of her work with the imaginal dimension of life. The title will be Opening to the Imaginal from Psychic Decolonization Toward Decolonization of 
all our relations. And then one week later, on the 20th of March, we want to invite you to the book launch of Mary Watkins' works, Waking Dreams and also Invisible Guests. Both works uh, are being republished in one volume in the Jungianium series, Recovered Classics in Analytical Psychology. So save the dates. We will remind you through the uh, usual channels. And um, again, thank you, everybody. And um, we say good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.